This is a uh, William Castle produced and directed film. William Castle is an interesting guy. Um, it's hard for me to categorize the films that are exploitation films in the 60s because um, they are exploitation in a way, but in the 70s, those are the ones that we really think about when we think exploitation. But there was a genre of low budget movies that's really hard to categorize. And I think William Castle's kind of falls into that category where um, it, it is exploitative, but it's not the exploitation films we think of. Um, it's been called schlock, it's been called drive-in movie era, gimmick horror, um, shock theater, things like that. There's no real great definitive name for it. I just call it the drive-in era, but that's not fully accurate because it's more than just drive-ins. But for Castle in particular, his thing was to use props, shocking seats, having skulls, and um, like skeletons move around the theaters, different things like that. 3D to get people out into the um, theaters and out of their homes. What do you think of like that era of low budget movie making and William Castle, I guess, in particular? I, I know William Castle was considered the, the gimmick king, like he pioneered a lot of that stuff. The kind of like how you said the, the what would what, you say? The schlock. Yeah, the, I'm all tied. The, <laughs> the, the gimmicks. Skeletons out of the, yeah. the scene or the, the shock chairs and tingler, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, those are the only two of his that I, can think of. I don't remember if 13 Ghosts was his. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wh wh whether it's all attributed to him or not, that, that was a gimmick that a lot of people used at the time um, mm -hmm. to get people. And also warnings was a big thing as well. Like, don't see this movie or if you see this movie and you die, we will pay for your funeral services and <laughs> things like that, you know? Uh, so it was just like a general thing that filmmakers did back then. Um, you know, when they didn't have a lot of money and stuff like that. Um, I thought it was interesting. Um, it, that stuff doesn't really do it for me because I'm not a big theater guy in general anyway. But I think that's the kind of like the pioneer or the precursor to midnight screenings, things that we have now where like people will see the room and then when they see the painting of the spoon, they'll throw like plastic spoons at the screen and you have people go and dressing in drag, seeing Rocky Horror Picture Show, et cetera, et cetera, or with other Troll 2 and other low-budget movies. See, I, I was a little behind on that. I, for some reason, I thought that uh, Jodorowsky with uh, El Topo was the one that kind of started the whole midnight movies thing. Um, I didn't realize it went as far back as William Castle. No, I'm just saying, like, the thing that the way people celebrate bad movies now mm -hmm. is kind of like, you know, it's a, he having those gimmicks and props in a movie theater kind yeah. of like started with William Castle. That's the only connection I'm making. But if you're talking about, yeah, midnight movies, as far as other terms, yeah, there was like ZTV, I think was started. And that's, um, I forgot the guy who did that, but he would show a lot of midnight movies either like foreign films, erotic films, and things like that, that people didn't yeah, really see. Like all that art house stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that term, midnight movie, I guess, isn't a great term, but I guess yeah, I, people I, I, bring I, in, I, in props. <laughs> so, yeah. um, also, another thing I found interesting about this movie and reading up on it is that this it actually inspired Psycho, um, which um, came out a year later uh, because uh, both Castle and Hitchcock would have cameos in their movies. Um, and there was, you know, uh, Castle would emulate a lot of things that Hitchcock did. And I guess this was kind of like a tit for tat. Hitchcock saw this and said, hey, this low budget, schlocky, like horror movie is making a ton of money. I can do my own and with better craft and came out with Psycho a year later. I thought that was pretty interesting. I forget if Psycho was also the one that he tried doing on a TV budget, like. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
at that point, he was really a TV guy because he had his own that TV show as well. So mm -hmm. um, his popularity now, uh, as we think of it, it wasn't it wasn't sustained throughout his whole career. He was really a big guy in the UK. Then came over here, did Rebecca, and that was a huge success. Yeah. But we're talking like around 1940. So by the time we're talking in the 60s, his career kind of waned down. Some of the mm -hmm. films we look at as classics now, like Vertigo, were not commercial successes. So he wasn't really a big name when he did Psycho. And it was on a TV budget, but it obviously was a big movie and it revived his career in certain ways. So, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, but stuff like that isn't uncommon. Like for me, like uh, I watch a lot of older movies and mm -hmm. High Noon was one of my favorite Westerns. And in response to that was made Rio Bravo, my favorite movie of all time, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, a response to that was Tarkovsky came out with um, Solaris. And again, those are two of my favorite movies. I wouldn't put, you know, I wouldn't say that of all those movies I mentioned, I wouldn't necessarily put this movie in those categories, <laughs> but I guess it all follows kind of like that same logic, you know? Uh, but what are your, before we get into the movie too much, what are your general thoughts on this movie? Did you like this? I, I thought it was fun. This is, this was my second time re-watching it. I don't, I don't pull it out of the, the shelf too often, but I, I think for what it is, it's a, it's a fun watch. The, I guess basically the beginnings of what popcorn film were. It's, you know, just something to just goof with and just pass time. But I, I think it's, it's fun for what it is. The, I think the female character, Nora, she, I get the impression she only got hired because she has a set of lungs on her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very, yeah. I want to get into those actors, especially her, her because I, I had my issues with her. But yeah, one other general thing I'll say about this movie is I was shocked when I looked online to some of my favorite aggregator movie sites like Rotten Tomatoes and All Movie and saw like how well praised this movie was because horror movies in general don't get praised by critics. Very few do. Yeah. And for something schlocky and campy and not serious like this to be as highly rated as it was shocked me because this had an 88% of Rotten Tomatoes. The Shining had an 84 and this had uh, four and a half stars on all movie, which is just as much as the Shining did. And I look at the Shining as the greatest horror movie ever made. And I look at this as like, okay, schlock, you know, but, yeah. Um, for some reason, this movie is, is, is well loved. I thought it was okay. I've seen it a lot more than twice because it's easy to, di it's easily digestible, but, yeah. um, it's not great, you know, <laughs> and getting into what you were saying, I guess we can get into the actors. We'll start with the actress that, that played, uh, Nora. She was so goddamn annoying, man. I'll, <laughs> let, I'll let you get yours out first, but. Oh God, I cringed every time I saw her on screen. It, it got to the point really to where I, I kind of started being very catty and very female about it. Like, you look weird. I don't like you. <laughs> you scream too much. You annoy me. <laughs> yeah, her name is Carolyn Craig. She did a lot of TV stuff and I was shocked at how big her filmography was. When I saw this movie, I was like, all right, this is probably the only movie she did. Like she's probably the niece or the aunt of like somebody who's funded the film and they had to get her in there somehow, but she had a pretty lengthy career, but her performance was so annoying and it lacked any dimension to it. She was either like really quiet or just like screaming at the top of her lungs. You know, there was no nuance to her performance. Yeah. I mean, other than just her being part of the, the plot, I don't think her character really had any purpose in the film other than just this very minor thing. And I think she could have been written a lot better, but she's very just two dimensional. And I, I get that. Like her character is just there to, to serve a purpose, but it's, I, I wish someone had, had coached that woman. Don't scream so loud. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's like, and again, there's no nuance to it. It's just like every little thing, it's like it just got the exact same reaction. I found her annoying as a character, and I found her acting to be like really bad as well. She was also very clingy. I forget what the the guy actor's name was, but she kind of started hanging around him like, help me, you got to get out of here. I'm like, he's not your boyfriend, lady. Leave him alone. <laughs> I guess the reason we all watched this movie was for Vincent Price. Um, yeah. And I see you're wearing a shirt of his um, yeah. <laughs> or a shirt with him in it. Are you a big fan of his? I, I enjoy his films. I haven't seen everything, but... Uh, I do like Madhouse. I, I love Dr. Fibes. Um, I don't remember House of Wax too well, so I don't. But um, yeah, I, I try to go across the board with as, as many of the, the classic actors as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I do like him. Um, I also reviewed another film of his, The Last Man on, yeah, Last Man on Earth, um, based on the book as well, um, of uh, I Am Legend. I thought he was really good in that, and his version was my favorite of the three with Omega Man and I Am Legend. Uh, so I thought he was really good in that. But I, as much as I enjoy him, he doesn't really have a lot of nuance to him. I would say for me, he comes off as like a mortician. Mm -hmm. If you like the way you envision a mortician would be, he's very somber and comforting, and he's kind of monotone at times in his line deliveries. Mm -hmm. um, but it's almost like he's he's just very much consoling you as he talks, but it's very macabre because of the things that he's actually saying, you know? So it, it, there's that contrast of how he's acting and what he's saying. It's kind of like he was a, an old school Hannibal Lecter, how he, especially like the TV show version, he's very suave, very classy. And it's kind of like, Vincent Price is, is very dressed up into the nines also, but there's also this very weird nonchalantness about how he just says things like, well, you know, here are some pistols. They're just party favors. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, for me, like it, 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 with this movie, especially, but for a lot of Vincent Price movies, a lot of it is in his dialogue, his performance. It, 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 the dialogue that he says, the way he says it, the tone, the cadence of his mm -hmm. of his voice and his mannerisms. Um, I and I think like a lot of his dialogue is, like I said, particularly this movie, but a lot of them is very expository, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's just flat out narration as well. And for me, like a Vincent Price performance, I could listen to it without actually even watching it. Because he's almost just like a, he's like telling ghost stories in a way. Because not a lot happens in this movie. A lot of what's happening is him telling you stuff, you know. Um, and I think he's good at that. But I do find that like motif in a lot of his movies, where it's just like a lot of explaining and exposition dumping. I, I don't know if it was a style thing during the era or if it was to do with his voice, uh, but yeah, there, there definitely is a bit of that. Um, I think even in the Roger Corman collaborations that he did, the, the Edgar Allan Poe movies like Mask of the Red Death, things like that, um, which I, I think it's, it's interesting that he's known for his voice because he didn't take diction lessons or anything. He, he self-taught himself to, to speak in that manner. Maybe that's why it's so distinctive. If he did, he would sound like everyone else. So yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Another thing I find interesting with Vincent Price is I think he kind of took off when he was in his like middle age or in his 40s and older, because I tend to find like a lot of his love interests are at least 10 to 15 years younger than him, if not a lot more. And I don't know if that adds to the macabre feel of him because I never find in any of his movies and especially with this, that there's any kind of romantic feelings with him and his love interest. If anything, I'd more believe like he's a father figure than like a love interest to any of the women yeah. he's connected to. 
I, I would just go with the Hollywood reasoning on that. It, it looks good on film in real life. It's not such a hot look, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it gets a pretty girl out there up front. And it's kind of like, come watch this movie. Even if you don't like the actors, there's pretty girls in it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, one other person that I, I'd like to highlight in this is Elijah Cook Jr. Um, not really like a household name. It's kind of those one of those actors, if you see his face, you're like, yeah, I saw him in that movie. Can't remember the name of it. But he's in a lot of good movies. Rosemary's Baby, uh, The Killing, Shane. And he's in three other movies that I actually already reviewed. The Big Sleep, Maltese Falcon, and Messiah of Evil. But he's one of those character actors that's in a, a lot of movies and a lot of pretty good ones. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, I mean, Vincent was good. Cook was good, but overall, I just, the actors didn't do it for me, and the acting felt very um, community theater type level of acting. Mm -hmm. Kind of. Um, I mean, other than than just the Nora character, I mean, the only one that ever that really stands out for me is the I don't remember the character's name, but he played the drunkard. Mm -hmm. The piece kind of wandering all over the house, like, well my family members were murdered in here and this place is haunted and the ghosts are coming for you. And it's, it's our, that's the logical junior. That's oh, it's, stuff it's yeah. just weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. What, what are your overall thoughts on the, on the movie itself though? Because I thought like a lot of what was going on was super implausible and there were so many holes in the plans of the wife and in the plans of price so many things can go wrong. Yeah. Like you're building a harness to pretend you're being hung. That um, that uh, marionette that he built with the skeletons. Yeah. It's just so elaborate and so silly. You know, it's like hard to take any of it seriously. Yeah, like when the the suicide scene, my first question was, who hoisted her up there? I'm like, there, it happened in such a small span of time. I'm like, there's no way you could set up something like that so quickly. And it, it can't be a suicide because how would she get up there? And they pointed that out in the film as well. Um, obviously the vat of acid thing with the whole, the only thing that doesn't disintegrate in their bones, which is a lie. They, they can, it just takes longer. The, the one that really stood out for me, and it goes back to Nora, is where was this party list? Because how did how did the wife and the, the psychiatrist guy, like how did they know to, to choose this woman? Is the fact that he's a psychiatrist, they know she's the hysterical type. Like they knew how to pinpoint her to be the one to kill Vincent. Um, it just leaves more questions than answers. And it's it's that could be more of a game itself. Like why this, why that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's, it's like Swiss cheese. There's so, so many holes in the logic and the execution of these elaborate plans. But I guess it's supposed to be a movie you don't think about because if you put any thought into it, it's like you're building a hanging harness and you're hovering outside of a house and pushing that rope through the window. It's like, how are you doing that? Mm -hmm. All of this elaborate planning just to get her to shoot him and for Vincent Price, again, you're building that skeleton marionette. You got the, this pit of acid, all of these things. It's like, he even says it in the movie, if I wanted to kill my wife, I could do it at any point. But yet yeah. he built this whole elaborate thing, which kind of contradicts that. It's just, it's yeah, just mind boggling. Um, and yeah, and I, I think that's funny. Kind of like, I think killing his wives happens to be his thing. Like he points out in the film or somebody points out that previous wives had died from heart attacks or fear related incidents. The current wife happens to be his fourth wife. She had a previous, previous incident where she tried to poison him, but they're still together. Yeah, yeah. I think Price mentioned that early on. What are you going to poison me again? And then she mentioned that he was married several times as well. And yeah, a lot of them died of heart attacks. It's just, I don't, I don't know. It, it's a lot of it's silly. And maybe I wouldn't have put as much thought into it if I wasn't reviewing it. But for me, like looking at it analytically to do a review, the acting bothered me, I guess, more than it would if I was watching it casually. And the plot in the story was just like so flawed and so frustrating to like try to make sense of it. It's like, 
what the f are you thinking? It's like every as I'm trying to like make notes and think about this movie. But I think if you're going to turn your brain off, you're not going to analyze it, and you're looking for something silly to watch, it's a good watch. Um, yeah. But then I would also say if you're into stories like this, um, which is basically kind of the premise of uh, Ten Little Indians, where you have a bunch of people gathered in a house, one of them is the killer. And they're there under mysterious circumstances. There's the old dark house, there's Clue, and then there were none. And even like other genres, there's Cube, which is kind of similar to that. And there's um, uh, the Quentin Tarantino movie, the, uh, the Western he made, I forget the name of it. Um, Wait. Yeah, yeah, The Hateful Eight, yeah. It's all kind of similar where you have a bunch of people in a house one of them's a killer. It's been done better, but this isn't the worst, and it's also short, so it's worth a watch. But I wouldn't go out of my way if I haven't seen it before, though. What are your final thoughts on it? Uh, it's it's interesting that you you say that because I was I was actually on a different note, kind of like the whole I was thinking murder mystery thing, but I was also wondering to myself, was this more or less kind of one of those, the beginning of those stories where it's kind of like, well, we have to make it till daylight. Like we just have to survive this one night and we're out of here. And that's, that's kind of more what I got from it. But I, I kind of saw it more as like, it, it's a murder mystery presented as a fake horror film type thing. Yeah. Well, the source material is a mystery, but generally as it's been translated, a lot of times it's in horror movies. But even some of those men- movies I mentioned, Clue is a comedy, The Hateful Eight's a Western. So in Cube, yeah, I guess Cube is a horror, but it doesn't necessarily all have to be horror. But it does incorporate both those elements where it's just like you're trapped together for a certain period of time and mm-hmm. figuring out which one of the people in the house is the killer is kind of like what's pushing the characters. And then the ticking clock is, okay, like, you know, we have to survive by the next day or by whatever, you know? So yeah, the story generally uses both of those elements where there's a time element and there's trying to figure out who the killer is element as well. So yeah. Um, yeah okay. So uh, I, last time or the first time we did this, uh, I kind of accidentally stumbled on asking you some trivia. So um, I kind of wanted to do it on purpose now. So I found a website that has it. These questions are super easy. So the first one you get wrong will stop. But if you get like all of them right, I guess <laughs> we'll stop at some point as well. Okay. All right. So um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, you ready to go? Okay. Okay. So a uh, serial killer wearing a William Shatner mask. Halloween. Bingo. Okay. A horror <laughs> movie where the protagonist uh, is writing a book with the line, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Shining. A classic horror movie um, in which the original title was The Babysitter Murders. I think that was still Halloween, wasn't it? How many of people associated with The Exorcist died during production? This is hard, so I'll give you multiple choice actually died during the production of The Exorcist? Nine, three, six, or 12? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get it wrong. I'm going to go with three. 